Thank you everyone for joining us on this rainy day. We have um, 184 people online um, and Steve Kimlin is going to do the introductions and our colleague Irene is going to do the acknowledgements of country. And we're just going to be in the background here getting our slides ready, so don't mind us, thank you. Great, great. Look, I think uh, I'm sure that others will join us. Uh, we'll continue to have people joining us, but I, I'm keen to uh, to get things moving as soon as possible so that we can we can hear uh, the permanency uh, our presentation from Dr. Peter Bacora. Uh, so I'm looking forward to today very much, but uh, the most important place to start today, of course, is with acknowledgement of, of country. And so I'd like to, to introduce our Aboriginal colleague, uh, Irene Wardle from Sydney University's Research Centre for Children and Families. Um, Irene, thank you for, for being prepared to, to open today. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. Uh, Waramai Nalawa Midigar. Hello, come in and sit down, friends. Seeing that we're all zooming in, we're hopefully everyone's in a comfortable position. My name is Irene Wardle, and my mother was born under a great gum tree on the lands of the Birupai Nation on the far north coast of New South Wales. My great-grandmother was removed and placed in the Sydney Basin around Parramatta, and we acknowledge her ancestry as Darik. The webinar today focuses on practices with working with vulnerable families, and as an Aboriginal mother, grandmother, and aunt to many, I wish to speak about the story of the bush native bee as my acknowledgement to country and their significance to kinship. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters that each and everyone is zooming in from across Australia and the First Nations of the world. I'm zooming in from Duncan Young country and I acknowledge the traditional Duncan Young people from the central coast of New South Wales. I pay my respects to my elders, past and present, and the future knowledge keepers who continue the traditions and cultures for future generations. Bees, bees are the key to both our future and the past. The Australian native bee can pollinate both the native plants of Australia and those that have been imported here. Why do I mention the bee in my acknowledgement of country? I've been taught by my mother, who was a beekeeper in her childhood and teenage years. She held the responsibility as an older sibling to maintain the hive, care for the bees throughout the Great Depression and during World War II. The bee is very much the foundations of the kinship structure. It is made up of many and led by only a few wise ones. The bee doesn't sting. It can survive without violence and the foundation of the kinship is based on love and support. The Granny's Law guides the family structure, maintains cultural links and traditions that are practiced for thousands of years. Survival is only possible if the family unit is maintained and connected to, our, to identity and belonging and that can be filled within the hearts of our babies. The bee represents the loving work of my elders who continue the work of the beekeeping families, creating pathways for survival with foreign entities that have been introduced to the community. As the elders say, they must learn to pollinate only that which builds and promotes health and nurtures resilience for the family and culture. Aboriginal families work in the same capacity. Our hives are perceived as different to that of others and their family structure is made up of many members and not one person can hold all the power. Although Granny's Law does play an important role in the delivery of order amongst the extended family and her word is never questioned because it comes from a lifetime of occurred knowledge as wisdom, just like the Queen Bee. The bee represents the family, the ability to adjust under harsh conditions. Their home is very fragile and is perceived not as strong as imported bees however, has survived in the harsh Australian climates for many thousands of years, but still maintains a home, not as grand as its foreign cousins, but is full of unconditional love, traditions and customs that keep the family strong to support the children. The months of spring are at its busiest and the expectation is to fulfil its traditions of pollination. Unfortunately, the outside influences are becoming more uncertain and the bee has to adapt quickly and at times under enormous pressure. The bee survives through its extended kinship networks, creating hives, nominating the strongest female to rule. The men of the colony have their role too and are each respected in the positions they hold. 
The family is only as strong as its weakest member and they work together to maintain the traditions and cultures of certainty that hold them together. Just like the Native Bee, the kinship networks continue to provide the foundation to nurture strong, resilient children. As professionals in your chosen field, remember you too have a role to support the fragility in the bee colony, but know its strength and to encourage the celebration of the uniqueness and cultural traditions that have survived for thousands of years. So I welcome you all today and hopefully that um, you will take away my acknowledgement and think about the strengths within families and that you can um, highlight and preserve. Thank you. Thank you. I'll Thanks pass for it. Thank you very much, Ira, and really appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, it's so important to 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 start with acknowledgement, country. And I I thank you very much for that. And and I I too would like to acknowledge that and I'm on Bedigal country that I that I too am on a Aboriginal lands. So thank you. Look, it's uh, my pleasure now to uh, to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Peter Pakora. Uh, Peter's got a, a joint appointment as the Managing Director of Research Services for Casey Family Programs, as well as the Professor of School of Social Work at the University of Washington, where he teaches courses in public policy, child welfare program design, and human service management. The Casey Family Programs is an operating foundation, and instead of focusing on just grant making, it focuses on working directly with state and county child welfare agencies and provides some direct services itself. Casey uh, Foundation has had a long standing commitment to also working with First Nations people with direct service offices on free American Indian reservations where the offices were turned over to the tribe about 15 years ago and current agreements with over 15 American Indian tribal nations. So Peter's got a fairly unique position. He has a joint faculty appointment. The University of Washington is also the manager of the research team of the Casey Family Programs. He's conducted research with American Indian nations on various topics and is currently evaluating the Positive Indian Parenting Program with the Cowlitz Tribe. And he began his working career at a neighborhood based community center, you know, the, the original grounding Group, uh, which was a group home for runaways and as a social worker in foster care in Win Wisconsin, Wisconsin, I do apologise. Peter has consulted with a number of departments of social services in Australia, Great Britain, Hong Kong, Ireland, Italy, South Korea, the United States and other countries to design risk assessment systems for child protective services and refine foster care programs and implement intensive only home-based services. And so, uh, Peter, there's probably much more that I could say, but that would be the expense of now turning things over to you. And we look forward to what you have to say. And uh, can I also encourage, um, if there's particular questions that you wish to uh, to raise or issues that you wish to, 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 uh, uh, to have discussed, um, uh, Professor Amy Conley-Wright um, will be actively monitoring uh, comments that you might be making in the chat, um, uh, questions that you might be raising uh, with a view then to uh, uh, exploring with Peter uh, the issues that, uh, that that you want discussed. Peter's keen to cover certain material, yes, today, certain set material, but he's also very, very keen to respond to issues arising from the many participants uh, today. So. Um, over to you, Peter, and uh, uh, you're very well. I was going to give you a warm welcome, um, but that may not be the case, but a uh, very wet welcome. And let me also just acknowledge our, our colleagues uh, in many, many places in New South Wales at the moment uh, that are battling with, with flood. Um, and uh, our thoughts are with you, um, and uh, we wish you all the best at this time. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, Irving, for the uh, welcome as well. Uh, I want to thank the University of Sydney and the Association of Child Welfare Agencies for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, we're having a little trouble getting the right proper slides up, but we will we will get that sorted out. 
um, but we've got a two to a slide deck that I think should be fine that uh, Amy should be showing on the screen right now. Um, I too would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging as well extend that respect to our Aboriginal and our Torres Strait Islander colleagues um, who are joining the webinar today. Um, and a special thanks also to Amy, to Irene, to Steve, Suzanne, Frank Ainsworth, Pat Hansen, and Elizabeth Fernandez, who all have been helping me get more back up to speed um, after it's been 10 years since I was here in Australia. So a lot has changed over time and uh, it's been great to reconnect with some colleagues there. Um, Today, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the outline page there. Today, we're, um, <clears throat> I'll begin with a quick review of definitions, values, and principles related to permanency planning, just to sort of provide a common <clears throat> foundation for everybody. Then we'll dive into uh, our main focus, which are practice strategies to help children and youth achieve permanency. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion and barrier of barriers to permanency and gaps in the research that need to be addressed. Um, at multiple points along the way, as Steve mentioned, I'm going to stop for questions and comments. And so please use the chat function there because Amy's going to be monitoring that and she'll help us navigate um, some of the questions and comments. And then um, what we're planning to do is try to do a summary based of the chat material. And we may even do sort of a little brief Q&A uh, document <clears throat> for anything that we didn't get to that um, might be of relevance um, to folks. So we'll we'll send that out to everybody um, in about a week or so after we've got a chance to polish that up for you. So uh, we'll really make good use of the chat function today in terms of your questions and comments. So appreciate folks um, doing that. And then <clears throat> we'll wrap up with um, Steve is going to provide a few minutes of closing remarks um, after Amy talks about a particular research opportunity that is available to folks if you want to take advantage of that. So let's dig into things. So the picture on the first slide here is um, you're going to see a few uh, sea creature pictures and those are just uh, pictures of um, some of the fish that I've encountered uh, while scuba diving on the uh, Great Barrier Reef. So um, trying to bring a little bit of uh, Australia and a little bit of um, nature into what I know has been a very damp uh, last part of your summer. Um, so let's go, let's talk about defining per permanency because we thought it'd be important to just quickly sort of ground the presentation by sharing how your country has a view of permanency that is shared by many other countries. Um, and, uh, you know, I cut to the heart of it in the sense that permanency and out of home care should promote a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging that happens because you've got a secure home, a sense of belonging because you've got good, positive, connected relationships, and a sense of belonging because you've got a right to and have connections with your culture and that those cultural connections have been maintained. And so we start on the screen, you'll see there's a defining permanency. The permanency definition comes right from Australia, from some of your key research reports. Um, I do want to point out, though, that many years ago, Robbie Gilligan from Ireland, he emphasized that there were two key aspects of permanency in addition to the legal permanency. And um, he he named relational permanency and physical permanency. Now, the first one, relational permanency, is you know sometimes called psychological permanency, and um, you know that's where the child, it's who the child sees as their enduring, caring adults in their life, right? And then the other dimension that uh, I think we take for granted, but it's an important one, is physical permanency. You know, being getting to a family situation or in a situation with a caring adult where you're not moving anymore because we've documented it through our research by the way how terrible how corrosive how damaging it is for children to be moving from placement to placement and i've talked with over 2,000 foster care alumni and believe me those stories are seared in my brain around that issue so the importance there is legal physical and relational permanency and it's all three of those dimensions with an attention to culture that we want to be paying attention to. So what do we value? 
let's start with our values, right? And I went right to your 2021 Australian framework for protecting children. And there I saw uh, um, some vital, essential uh, value statements um, that uh, we wanted to at least uplift today. And for those of you, I think many of you folks have maybe seen that report, it's there and you've got some beautiful values there already outlined in that in that framework. So I just want to mention that's there. You can read them at your leisure, but uh, we'll be emphasizing and reemphasizing some of these as we go through the presentation today. But let's let's talk about what do we know from theory? What is what is social science theory? Um, how can that inform our um, our permanency practice and our permanency policy and our permanency research? And, and I'll highlight just a few. Now, I know the academics will tell you that there are some aspects of classic attachment theory that are being questioned and are being revised, but I think there are some fundamentals from attachment theory that are well worth uplifting, and I'll mention two. Children do have critical periods where they do need to form attachments with caring adults. And we all know that healthy attachments with at least one caring adult is absolutely crucial for positive development and healthy functioning. So let's, I believe that we can use attachment theory to inform and justify why all of you are working so hard to help children find permanency. A second area is a little more recent, and that is the whole notion of neuroscience and brain science. And um, the advances in that research have revealed that there are, in fact, critical developmental periods for brain science development. And I'll give you an example. When you have a lack of emotional stimulation, and Amy documented this in her research in Romania, the, um, if, you have a, if you're neglected emotionally, you have less dural, less dense neural networks than people who have had the benefit of having caring and consistent adult relationships as, as um, infants. So we now know through brain science that it does have an impact physically on those neural connections, which has an impact and an implication for how the brain functions and develops. We also know that trauma, early trauma, oversensitizes our flight or fight function. So that brain stem piece of our primitive brain gets um, overstimulated and, and, um, and affected in a way that it can bounce back. Our neuroplasticity research does show that it can bounce back with the right support, but that's an important area um, underpinning our work around permanence. And then lastly, uh, from a child development uh, theory point of view, um, child development theory does tell us, uh, it, it stress the importance of children moving through uh, developmental stages in one, they can skip them and come back, but it's very important for us to pay attention to how permanency helps children navigate the kind of developmental processes that they need to have. So that's some of the theory. What do we know about from, uh, you know, from some of the more mainstream research? Uh, Early intervention is better than later intervention. So the earlier we can get to families, the quicker we can um, achieve permanency, the better, um, because the longer a child stays in care, uh, it becomes more difficult to reestablish or strengthen those family connections. So we know um, early intervention is important. Um, there's less trauma for children if they're placed with relatives or tribal clan members. We now know that from some of the early studies that, that that's a really important. If we can place children with kin, kinship care, all the better. Um, in the United States right now, we're um, um, placing 34% um, of the children who go into foster care are being placed with relatives. And in some communities, we're trying to get that up to 80 or 90%. It takes a lot of hard work. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but kinship care is really important. Um, the third piece of research um, that is uh, there that it's the whole notion of let's put the efforts into keeping children and families together in the first place. Because once we place that child, it's it's we're playing catch up and you know there's a whole bunch of trauma and stress that that comes into play. So I want to bring up a principle that June Lloyd 
articulated many years ago, and June Lloyd was a pioneer in family preservation services. And her, her mantra was, we should be willing to invest as much in keeping a family together as, as than what we would spend in tearing them apart. And I'll say that again. Government should be willing to invest as much to keep a family together as we would in placing that child. And I, uh, I think June did all of us a service in sort of articulating that, uh, that very important principle. And there's one other principle that I think uh, goes without saying here that we should mention, and that is throughout our conversation this, this morning and this afternoon, um, I think it's important to mention that child safety is paramount. No child should be left with their parents or reunified, restored, if those parents are unable or unwilling to provide what is essential to raise that child. So every day I want to acknowledge that there are child protective services and foster care staff throughout Australia who are making difficult decisions about that because they have to see that somehow child safety safety can be maintained or reestablished so that that child can stay at home or be restored back home. And so um, we'll be talking a lot about a lot of therapeutic strategies but I just do want to emphasize the bottom line on here for child welfare is child safety, and that has to be maintained in whatever we do. Um, because sometimes people will accuse us in child welfare of, of um, family preservation services at the, at the cost of child safety. And I think we want to dismiss that kind of criticism and say that that, that is at the heart of what public and voluntary child welfare agencies are all about. Um, so let's talk about what else do we know from research? Um, permanent placement in the form of legal guardianship with relatives, kin, or tribal members. We now have research that shows it's less traumatic and it's more stable. Children tend to stay with those relatives. They're less likely to give up on them. The placement cha changes are much less. So we have very good data on that from a number of countries. Um, on a more negative side, um, racial and ethnic disparities are still with us. And um, in terms of who achieves permanency and how quickly children achieve permanency. So, uh, for example, in the United States, our permanency rates are improving with our African American children. They've always been pretty good with our Latino children, but we are making very little progress with our American Indian children. Um, those rates are still too slow. Our, too many of our American Indian children are being um, reported to Child Protective Services, being placed and languishing in care. So um, uh, we share your angst with your Aboriginal and your Torres Strait Islander families because that is an area we are making little progress in in the United States and we are, as a foundation, we are doubling down on that effort is we've got to make better progress than what we're doing there. So I just want to acknowledge that racial just disproportionality and disparity is well with us, and we've got to do something about it. But Fred Wolshin's research reminds us that not every community is the same, and that there are communities and there are agencies that are making excellent progress in this area. And there are communities where there is less racial disproportionality. And the goal here is let's learn from those communities. Let's learn from those agencies. What are they doing to achieve that? What can be replicated in other communities? And what strategies are they doing that can be scaled up? Those are some things that we have to be careful we don't um, overlook because there are success stories in every country. And what we want to do is be uplifting those success stories and learning from them. I do want to call out and we'll have the link in the PowerPoint. Hopefully that's a hyperlink that'll work. There's a new Child Trends. Child Trends is an organization, research organization in the United States. They have a new brief out that is arguing that if the United States, that we've got to reframe black family cultural assets, that there are these core protective elements that many black families have in the United States, their cultural values, their traditions, their practices. And these are crucial to developing policies and practice 
that enhance family and child well-being. And uh, child trends is saying, we've elected officials, researchers, philanthropies, agencies, we've got to use our resources to find out what those protective elements are, how that's evolving over time in a modern society, and what can we do to support those families. And I think of it in terms of Australia, you know, how have the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander families' cultural assets shifted over time? How have they evolved? And what can be done to help them um, better avoid involvement in child welfare and keep their families strong? So it's a it's an area I think for all of us to explore. Um, well, what do we else? What else do we know from research? Well, when children cannot be restored, you know, when they cannot be reunited with their parents, we do know that remaining in long-term foster care often results in poor child and adult outcomes. Um, and in my alumni studies, I have um, talked with alumni as old as age 51 and as young as 19. So I've, we've had the, the, the special opportunity to talk with um, foster care alumni in a bunch of different states and I've learned a lot from that. And believe me, the outcomes are not as good as we would like. Um, fortunately, though, there are permanency alternatives to consider if family restoration is not possible. Um, sometimes people ask me, um, in the United States right now, when children go into foster care, our latest national data, 48% of those children are reunified. 25% of those children find permanency through adoption, and 16% find permanency through legal guardianship with a relative or a very close family friend or a tribal member, okay? So 48% are reunified out of care, 25% are adopted, and 16% are um, finding legal guardianship. I just wanna give you that as if every country's different, you have your own culture, your own mores, your own funding streams, your own national policies, but it's a point of comparison there. The point is we've got alternatives. That's the whole notion of having a permanency continuum. What works best for that culture, for that country, for that family, for that child, right? And so that's why we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those options there. And uh, one of them is like, you'll hear me mention it, legal guardianship as an example, and a couple of forms of adoption that um, already um, can be used in, in Australia and that maybe um, you might wanna consider some variations of or increasing those. Now, before we talk a little bit about that, um, let's get into some of the practice stuff and then I'm gonna stop after this next slide, two slides, and we're gonna stop for any questions or comments and Amy's gonna help us navigate the chat. But um, the first thing we do know from research, another thing we know from research to close that out is permanency planning doesn't start with child placement. Permanency planning starts with a very careful assessment of what that child and family's needs are. And I mentioned that because it's got to be multidimensional. It's got to be done with cultural humility. And the whole goal here is we've got to learn from the child, their parents, and their cultural community about what is the best for that family situation with that bottom line being child safety, right? And for example, who in that child's social network, if the child can't be restored, who should be considered first as their permanent guardian? You know, is it an aunt, an uncle, a grandma, a grandfather? Um, you know, who should be that? So who's in their social network? And then um, finally, what we know from research, I think that's our final research slide here, I'm gonna stop, is if adoption is the best option, what kind of adoption? And I understand in Australia right now, you it, it is open adoption, is used in some limited cases, and um, increasingly in the United States, closed adoption, the most traditional form of adoption is not being used as often and the bulk of our adoptions now are, are open adoption. So uh, I think we're following in your footsteps around open adoption being a, a possible um, option there. Um, a type of adoption that is not used much in the United States but is now getting greater recognition, and when I get back home, it's one of those things I think we're gonna be pushing with our American Indian colleagues, is customary adoption. 
And the reason that my American Indian colleagues tell me they have valued and have used customary adoption for many, many years is that it doesn't require the termination of parental rights. And that is such an important aspect that in many of our tribal nations, um, it lessens shame, it creates less trauma, it helps maintain a more comfortable family set of relationships. And so I think, I predict in the United States, we're going to see more customary adoption, which I understand for your Torres Strait Islander families, you already do in some cases. So I think we're gonna try and follow um, that pathway as well in the United States and explore um, these that new form of our new age old actually, but that form of adoption because it doesn't require termination of parental rights and see what we can do. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to get into actual some actual practice strategies. Talk a little bit more about multi-dimensional um, uh, assessment in, in the next section there. But we've covered a lot of sort of uh, foundational ground, context setting ground. We wanted to stop and see if there are any questions or comments that maybe I can address. There are several questions, oh, okay. <clears throat> Peter. And <laughs> one is just to first clarify, um, just when you when you use the term reunification, you're using the, the term we use in New South Wales as restoration. So you're using that as equivalent to equivalent. restoration. And I'll, yeah, and to I, thank you. And I think yeah. what you'll see me use the rest of it, I'll try to use the word restoration knowing that that's uh, your proper term here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And and we have a few questions. Uh, so we have a question about, um, there were some comments appreciating the concept of culture and cultural practice as assets. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you could comment about the relationship of permanency to other aspects of identity in addition to culture. And then we have some other questions. Uh, increasingly in, in some of our work, um, I did one of the, uh, one of the few studies around spirituality of youth and care. And we asked youth about their spirituality and what, what that meant to them and how was that a, a support to them. So we often don't talk about spirituality and religious affiliation in our field. And yet, if you talk to youth and care, it's an important piece. Mm -hmm. So um, when I think of um, where a child ought to be placed and what kind of supports um, we ought to be providing, we don't talk much about that, but I think it's something that's worth exploring. And the youth that I've talked to said it can help them heal. It's a health of support, whatever version of a higher being they have and whatever affiliation with whatever religious groups that for many of these young people in care, it's an important pathway. So I'll mention that one. Um, the other one is sexual identity. And we know um, in many countries, GLBTQQ youth, our gay and lesbian youth, are overrepresented in care. They are rejected by some of their family members, and that's why they end up on the streets, running away, or in foster care. So when we think of permanency options, uh, we have a few states that have, have actually tried to ban um, gay and lesbian parents from being licensed as foster parents or as adoptive parents. Thankfully, most of our states those laws or guidelines have been struck down and um, we're really trying to work very hard to make sure that children of various sexual identities have those options available to them and that there are parents that can support them. So that's another dimension of um, diversity and at times marginalization that I think we need to be paying attention to along with the cultural issues. And we're gonna talk and dive into a bit more um, issues of culture and cultural supports a little later in the presentation, but I'm glad someone raised that early on. So yeah. thank you, I hope that's helpful. Thank you, and that was interesting getting the reference about the spirituality research. I will get that so study out to you. Yeah. People yeah. love that study because they mm -hmm. love the fact that we talk to youth directly. Yeah. yeah. Then we had some questions about uh, how could you help messaging with casework staff about relational permanence and the need for a strong network when the focus is primarily about finding a physical, safe, stable placement? We created, and I'll try and get this out to everybody, we created, a, it starts with the hearts and minds of your caseworkers and their supervisors. And a lot of times they don't have, they haven't been given the time to explore their values base and why permanency should be an important value of child welfare. And can we blame them if the practice doesn't follow, if we haven't really given them space to explore that? So we created a permanency values training that for public 
and voluntary, uh, this might call it private child welfare agencies, um, gave them some time and space to explore that. Because where the hearts are, the minds follow, right? Where it's hearts and minds. So um, we think it, it starts with making sure everybody's on the same page from a fundamentals point of view, but that often sometimes doesn't happen. So we'll, we'll make that curriculum available and people wanted to modify that and improve on it for Australia that I think our foundation would be Terrific. very happy to have that happen. Okay, thank you. We have a question about uh, reunification, restoration. So what about the situation of possibly or probably unexplained physical harm where risk scares people from even considering returning home uh, placements. Are there other research in that, is that in that area? I'm going to start out with talking about multi-dimensional assessment next, and we're going to really um, focus on that really important question. I think it's our next uh, our next piece. So thanks to whoever yeah. will raise that. You yeah. just are a step ahead of us. Uh, I'm going to really emphasize that a bit more. Okay, great. And just one question that kind of ties back to sure. the, the discussion about attachment theory, and I won't ask you to comment specifically about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families because you're in the United States, but can you talk about stability and attachment when children move between different family members um, and possibly communities due to transients and maybe different people are taking care of them? They may not actually be formally in the care system. Um, this is where I think cultural humility comes into play. That notion of with whatever community we're working with, how can we learn from those elders and those people with wisdom about how best do you um, encourage attachment, help people with relationship? There's a classic book, Claudia Jewett, for the scholars and the practitioners who are probably really my age, but she, she was one of the first practitioners to really say, you've got to take some active steps as a parent to help claim your child, to help that child feel like they're part of the family. Mm -hmm. And if that's an aunt or an uncle or a, um, an older sibling, um, what are the ways you can help make that child feel at home and feel like they're connected and part of the family? And I think that's where um, there are a lot of these practical strategies, photographs, rituals, celebrations, how someone's referred to, how they're named. Sometimes they take on a new last name. These are all important things that um, our field, I think, ought to be exploring. But learning from the local culture about how that's done. So I think that's an excellent question. I don't think we do enough of that, Did frankly. You say Claudia, Claudia Jewett wrote this classic okay. book. You know, some of these practitioners with age-old experience, and she was just sharing the ways that um, uh, uh, family members can help other family members settle in and feel connected, okay. whether as a birth family or as an adoptive family or a kinship family. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Those are all the questions for now. All right. So we'll Great. Yeah. So let's move into. Practice strategies. We'll start out with a lionfish or a squirking fish right there. So let's dig into the really what I think we were asked to really focus on today. And the, so, which is let's look at some a range of permanency strategies that uh, may already be happening in, in Australia uh, or that you might want to look at. Um, uh, none of these are perfect. I, I don't hold any of them out as the solution. There aren't any solutions, as we all know, in our field. Anybody who's looking for a magic wand is is nuts. It's you know our our the family complexities and the computing complexities we're dealing with, I think it takes multiple strategies. First off though, permanency planning, uh, as um, Bill Mizan and other, some of our other pioneers in child welfare um, would stress is, permanency planning believe, starts with an assessment. And it's an assessment of the child's safety, family strengths, family resources, and what community resources can be brought to bear to help ensure that child's safety. Because the person who raised that question in the chat is spot on. If we can't assure a child's safety, we won't be able to restore that child to that family. So child safety is at the heart of this. And it I'll tell you, it's what kept me up at night as um, a foster care walk, worker in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It is what is, um, as I worked with child protective service workers around the country and in other countries as well, it is at the heart of what we worry about. And so that's why our, our restoration workers and our child protective service workers both need access to the best safety assessment tools we have available. And whether that's in Australia, signs of safety, 
structured decision making, some kind of predictive risk modeling that's ethics based, um, multi dimensional assessments. I'm going to hop over here and we'll, we'll talk about a tool that was developed in New Zealand, uh, three houses. Mm -hmm. um, the point here is child safety assessment and spotting risk factors and what you can do about them is at the heart of our work because if we can't guarantee child safety we can't restore that child so i i may be belaboring this but i think it's at the heart of what we worry about certainly government that's what they're concerned about in terms of lawsuits and child tragedies let's hop over and i'll show you a tool so for example we'll hop to the next slide there nikki well did us all a service um, and now this is, by the way, there's an app on your phone that you can get through Nikki's website or through the Signs of Safety, uh, or I think it's well as Resolutions Consultancy. There's a phone app because if you're a worker in the field, it's nice to have a phone app. Frankly, me, I'm old school. I like stuff in paper. I take this out with a box of crayons and, and markers. And this is how the workers that I know of in Australia and Canada and First Nations people um, use it. Three Houses is basically a worksheet for children, parents, and other stakeholders to talk about what are they worried about in that family, what's going well that they can build on, and what are their dreams for the future. And this simple tool, when the, when the staff member knows how to do it, mm -hmm. can really unlock people to talk about what they're feeling and what they're seeing. So um, you might say, oh, what a simple tool. In the hands of the right worker, these tools can sometimes break through family secrets and it helps the child communicate in their language, in their pictures, because sometimes kids will draw stuff. They won't, they won't be very articulate, but they will draw what's worrying them. They'll draw what they want to see. And these tools are starting to become used uh, across the world now this type of a tool as a way to help get a conversation started and some of these find their ways to the refrigerators in the uh, in the family's home and it's added a case plan right below it that's done in simple language and that's what some of the best safety um, assessment approaches are using and we have to um, thank nikki weld out of new zealand for that slide let me back up a slide we'll back back to that other slide um, I mentioned appreciative inquiry because when we when we're there on that front porch of that family's house or we're sitting in the living room, we want to use techniques like appreciative inquiry, motivational interviewing to help engage in a real conversation with people. And that's part of the assessment process. And if and these are these techniques um, I find and the workers I've talked to tell me are very, very helpful in helping people get a more proactive, less defensive conversation going. So I mentioned these all as tools for that very first very important stage, which, which is getting a multi-dimensional family assessment that really helps you understand the strengths, the resources, and what are the risk factors that are there in play. As we know in foster care, sometimes a child's been in care for two or three or four years, and no one's really revisited where that birth family is. And until someone does that, how do you know that the risk factors that put that child in care in the first place have been addressed? Or are some elements of that still there? So that's why safety and risk assessment, you do it at the front end, you also do it at the restoration end, right? And that's why you wanna have continuity in those practice tools. So the foster care workers are using the same language and conceptual maps as the child protective service workers, consistent concepts. Okay, so that's that's the assessment piece of it. That's one part of practice. Let's go on to some other practice strategies. Um, I hear that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have a have their own ways of finding relatives and finding family members, and I love that. And people say it with a smile because they have their ways, and I think that is important to recognize. Building on that, or if you don't have those techniques, I do want to call out something that is starting to spread around the world, and that is Kevin Campbell's family finding. Kevin um, took on some of the techniques from the Red Cross and other strategies 
And then he brought it into child welfare. And what he would say is, you got to go find 40 family members. That's the goal, he says. You got to go out and really map the networks. Who's in that family's network? Where are these long lost relatives that unless you push and ask in good ways, you won't know that there's an aunt in a 300 miles away that's a Zoom call away from being connected to that child or a long lost grandmother that on the father's side that could be reconnected. Uh, so I, I, I like his technique. I know he's been doing some work with uh, Science of Safety and other folks around the world. Um, I think his, his techniques are practical and um, uh, a lot of countries are starting to have him, uh, they're adapt, you know, adapting the work to their culture, their country. But uh, I, I love that idea of family finding and, and, and that piece. Um, a, a couple of projects here in Australia have mentioned icebreaker meetings. That's our sister foundation. Annie E. Casey has a manual, very practical manual on it. But basically, it's making sure that when a child is first placed with a foster family, the birth family and that foster family are supported in having an icebreaker, an initial meeting to get to know each other. And that that is, you know the families are nervous. You know the families are anxious. You know it, it without proper support, sometimes those meetings sort of go off the rails. So the icebreaker structure is designed to help set those meetings up for success because the better those two family groups can work together, it really starts to reduce the stress for the child and you up the chances that you can get a successful family restoration in place. So I mentioned that as another practical technique that people are exploring. And then the project here at the University of Sydney has, has really dove deeply into some of the really practical action steps that a worker can do to help make that happen and to help set up the pre visit play, planning and conversations and the post visit planning and conversations. You know, what happens when the child starts to wet the bed again or hoards food or can't sleep well or gets into fights at school because of some of the stress of having that visitation. So you want to have some think, some good thinking and some techniques for handling that and they'll be releasing some um, really nice beautiful fact sheets over the next few weeks, uh, practice sheets that you can use. So anyways, the whole point there is um, making being intentional and proactive in how you do those meetings. Um, another piece which you might go, oh yeah, that's just common sense, but it, it, it was important to us in our foster care work is spending time with family members. When children are in care, we have new research that very much documents the more time children spend with their birth family members, extended relatives, the quicker they get to placement uh, restoration and the more successful they are. And now some, you know, the experienced staff members go, oh, well, but what if that child has got a lot of emotional challenges? You know, they had a lot of trauma, depression, anxiety, whatever. Uh -uh. The research shows even youth with greater needs as measured by the CAN scale, the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strength scale, a John Lyon scale, even youth with really challenging behaviors and conditions, family time makes a difference and cuts through that. So it didn't matter how severe the child was on the CAN scale, they still had more success. And that surprised us a bit. We thought, oh, no, they're not going to. Nope, it, 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 it is a powerful dynamic that cuts through that. Uh, uh, we have those studies and we'll make though I think they're cited in the report and get those free off the, um, the links that are in the back of the references list. Um, I mentioned functional family therapy here because sometimes what gets in the way of restoration is the child is that at those early adolescent stages and they're angry, they're frustrated, they don't know how to handle that very well and they don't know how to relate to adults in their lives. And functional family therapy, Jim Alexander's work, has been really uh, practical in helping uh, caregivers manage and learn to work with youth who are really out of control and, and are having uh, difficulties in relationships. So I mentioned that as just one of a number of, of, of um, practical practice strategies that is now worldwide that um, you might want to look into. And then the last one I want to mention on this slide 
that I think has been used in Australia and a few other countries, ironically more in England and other countries than in the United States, even though it got built in Oregon, which is keep and keep safe. It's from the Oregon um, Social Learning Center. And it's basically behavior management strategies that they have documented. They, it's to help foster parents manage problematic child behavior in a way that reduces placement disruption, and they've documented that it reduces stress hormones. So they've done cortisol studies, though it's stress hormone, cortisol levels drop in the kids, and it helps the kids get back to place. So uh, get back to home faster. So that that is, uh, I mentioned those techniques. I think we're gonna go ahead a couple more slides and then uh, uh, we'll stop for a QA and a again and my sinuses are going nuts with the, the humidity here. Um, let's also talk about some other selected practice strategies. And I mentioned legal representation because we're learning that when you can get a skilled lawyer connected with a birth parent right at the time of the CPS investigation, if that lawyer is accompanied by a social worker and a veteran parent, a parent who has child welfare experience, what we call constituent consultants, I think, Amy, you guys call a person experts with by experts by experience. I love that term. Mm -hmm. Experts by experience. It's a team of three, and that's who works. Not just the lawyer, but it's a team of three. We're finding in some major studies that some children don't end up in care. Some children have a higher likelihood of being placed with relatives. And in a major study we did in New York City, um, it didn't prevent placement, but the children's length of time in care was shorter. Kids went home faster or got to permanency faster if that legal team was involved. And then we documented that New York City saved millions of dollars in foster care costs by investing up front in these parent legal teams. So I mentioned that, you know, again, Australia, you have your own laws and frameworks, but we're finding it's the team approach that makes the difference there with a nice lawyer who understands child welfare. Um, I did mention permanency values training. I'll just mention that again, because sometimes, again, workers need that support. They need that time to explore that solution-based casework because for some of us, it's it's a really nice way to focus on family strengths and get families thinking about how to solve problems instead of being stuck. So I mentioned that as a casework piece. <clears throat> and I know in Australia, like a lot of other countries, including ours, um, a big reason why children end up in care is because one or both parents are abusing alcohol or drugs. And so substance abuse treatment, which we just now, you might already have it on your books, but we finally last year have a federal law in place that pays for whole family substance abuse treatment. So mom and one or two children go into care, dad and mom and the two children, they go into a residential treatment center for a period of time and while mom and dad are getting the substance abuse treatment, those children are sort of looked at, but they're living together. And we're uh, we're about to, to, to document and then scale up a program that has been going for many years that is American Indian based. So I know your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, um, unfortunately, many of those families have encountered substance abuse problems. Uh, this program out of Arizona is run by an American Indian uh, pioneer. She's just fantastic. Um, and uh, Deidre is going to help us document her program and then just try and scale it up. So uh, again, for first time ever, we're having our federal government pay for this kind of treatment. And we think uh, keeping families together in substance abuse treatment is a really important one, along with the last piece there, which is the trauma informed practice, which um, that's a slogan in a lot of places right now. I think we need to really develop the practice science of what that means. What does it mean to be a trauma-informed practitioner? What does it mean to have your program really be trauma-informed? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we'll, we can share some materials on that, uh, around that, but it's, it's building on what we know about neuroscience, epigenetics, ACEs, and resilience framework. So uh, I do call that out as an area for child welfare. We need some support on that because our, our practice science in that is not well developed. Okay, I think um, before we get into organizational climate and culture, maybe we could just stop and see if there are any questions and comments, and then yeah. I'm going to be watching our time. We've got yeah. about a half an hour left. 
Unfortunately, someone no. did check out whether the Three uh, Houses app was available. It doesn't appear to be available in Australia, so we'll have to do some outreach to see if the developer is willing to share it here. Thank you. I know it's available in England right now, but I, yeah, we'll have to dig around a little bit. Yeah. Heard, yeah. Thank and you. Nikki's all, probably an email away. All right. No worries. Yeah, she's great. Right. Yeah. Um, and there were some comments about the, the need for more family-based treatment, alcohol drug uh, treatment here in Australia. And that, that's quite low. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline would like to know more about what happens with the legal team advocate approach. Why is it successful? What happens to create understanding or to promote change? I love it when we get our allied team members working together because sometimes child welfare is such a lonely job and you're trying to do this work on your own. And what I like about that is you got a lawyer who understands child welfare who help, who can help that parent know what their rights are and how to navigate, which is a very scary process first time many people have ever been before a judge or a court process it's frightening so you've got a uh, a lawyer there who can help handle the legal stuff but the parents are freaked out and what better person to support them than a parent who's been through it before and came out the other end successful so what i love about this model and it comes out of the pure parent for those of you who know developmental disabilities this is not a strange concept Peer parents have been around for years of develop in developmental disability. We should be build building on that. Um, so I like the peer parent piece of it. Peer practice has been around uh, a long time in other fields. Why shouldn't we use that in child welfare? And then you've got a social worker who helps the parent navigate some of the services and who understands the professional pieces of, of the counseling and support they might need. So for me, you get the best of all worlds. And that's what the families told us. And we've documented that in two articles in showing you a service review that uh, uh, we'll, we'll make available through the center here because um, they're uh, open open source now. Uh, we documented that on two very careful studies. So that's that's why I love it. I, I love it. I love the fact that you've got three three experts banding together to help the family. There's another clarification question, yeah. clarification question is whether um, that is the same as our guardian ad litem um, advocates um, <coughs> But I think Judy uh, Cashmore is here and she's saying no. Separate no. from that. Yeah, right, so we don't, yeah. don't, we don't seem to have something like that, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, yeah, but we do have, yeah, we do have the fish model. So our colleagues up in the Hunter um, and they have the family inclusion services of the Hunter and they are working in the courts, which is some really fantastic work and get in contact with Jessica Cox with uh, Life Without Barriers if you'd like to know more information. That'd be great. You know, another way it's been known is when children are placed with relatives, I don't you have what we call kinship navigators. I love that term kinship navigator because it's not stigmatizing. And it's a it's a, a parent who has done kinship care who acts as a peer coach to that aunt or uncle or grandmother or grandfather and says, hey, you've now got a grandson living with you and a child welfare agency looking over your shoulder. How do you navigate that system? And um, the, our, sometimes it's out of our aging department, which is a great way to tap into some extra dollars. Our aging services, because a lot of these people are elderly, are elder, are older. Our aging services pay for kinship navigators to work with our families and child welfare. So I love that. You know, the uh, the different uh, arms of government teaming up because sometimes our aging services can get money out of our legislators in a way that our child welfare legislation can't get. Voters, yeah. And so anyways, I love the kinship navigators, which our families love. They, it's a non-stigmatizing uh, source of support that is akin to these um, legal teams, these parent legal teams. Thank you. Yeah, and there's some other shout outs yep. for the Bumpy Road as a resource, uh, which um, our Dr. Susan Collins has been involved with. So yeah, that's another resource. Uh, there was a, an earlier, oh, actually there's also a question about the family time making a difference with children with behavioral issues and we can include that as the, some of the follow up. We'll send you some the slides. We have a report, uh, I just yeah. dove right into that from our uh, practice because again we've been providing foster care since 1966. So this is practice right from our field units. Excellent. That surprised us. Yeah. So we will follow up with the people who yeah. registered for that. Um, there was a comment circling back to your earlier comments mm -hmm. about issues of risk cannot be adequately evaluated when parents are defensive and trauma affected and distrusting from everyone from the government. This needs more resources than a single conversation or even a, a time limited assessment. It needs at least a few interviews. Do you want to comment about families sort of being and defensive, trauma affected, distrusting? And this government? is where a peer parent can be very helpful yeah. and the best teams pull in a team member um, because sometimes what that birth parent has to do is they've got to relate to someone else who's come through that child welfare system. Mm -hmm. And then um, that 
appreciative inquiry, motivational interviewing, and other techniques can really help that conversation be less defensive because mm -hmm. they're the questioner or the uh, person in the audience is absolutely right. You've got to break through all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of that starts with home-based practice, by the way. It's mm -hmm. uh, from my own practice experience, it, it's, I used to always work in kitchens and living rooms. It was very difficult to do that work in the office. I would make the trip out. That's where it starts. I think on the front porch, mm -hmm. living room, kitchen table, up over, yeah. over a cup of coffee or tea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's all for now, so we can move on to your next okay. slide. Um, I, we don't want to, <coughs> we've got a stream of research coming into our field now from Charles Glisson. I think you probably have scholars in Australia that say organizational climate and culture matter. And that if our organizational climate is not set up right, and if our top leadership is not articulating the right values that really support practice, it's hard to help our line staff do what it takes. So I do want to call out the power of leadership and that our organizational culture has on that. And there is documentation where Glisten has said a more positive organizational culture is actually documented, has more positive outcomes for kids and families. So there is that statistical link that's been made um, by his studies and I think others. So uh, I did want to mention that. Um, then building the culture of permanence is our next slide. Um, is um, It's so easy for us, particularly in government agencies, to let child safety dominate everything. And then it's all about child safety and we're all paranoid about that. And I mean that in the purpose, you know, we just get overly consumed with that. And uh, I think we've got to counter that. It is the top mandate. But how really do we safeguard children? Children are best raised in families. There are higher rates of abuse and neglect in foster homes, and there are even higher rates of abuse and neglect in institutions, group homes and in institutions where we have shift staff. It's just the way it is. They're more at risk situations. Um, and I do expert witness work in group care, so I know this. Uh, I'm, I'm the person reading the case records that is trying to make sense of that when I'm called in by an agency. And so um, for me here, it's building a culture of permanence. What is our top priority? And that is family preservation, because we know that's where children are raised best. And we've got to infuse that priority all the way through. And my friend uh, and colleague Kirk O'Brien would say is, and Sue Badeau, who's adopted six people and fostered over 50 children in her, her lifetime, would say, are the permanency oars in our rowboat rowing in the same direction? Are we all on the same page here? And can we do, and in fact, work better with a coherent practice model in, in, in place? Because if we don't have that, that's when staff members are just doing the best they can and we don't have coherent practice. So that I just wanted to mention that this, there's a culture of permanency that we have to um, work through. Um, we're at time, so I'm, let me get through a couple of things. This let's talk about cultural uniqueness because uh, every time I come to Australia, I know one of the real challenges here is, um, and just as we have with our American Indian nations, is um, how do we best work with our with Aboriginal and your Torres Strait Islander families. And for me, it's um, getting the right cultural experts involved on the teams, bringing and working with a sense of cultural humility. That there's a lot we don't know and that we need to learn. And our, the tribal elders are a great source of information on that. So um, some questions that we wanted to, to at least mention today that would be good to explore if you're not exploring them already, which is, you know, as uh, I've heard that your statistics are not, your outcomes are not where you want to be. You've got serious overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, uh, children in care. And like us in America, uh, with our American Indian families, they're staying in care way too long. They're not achieving the kind of permanence they desire. So the questions we're starting to ask ourselves is, what do line staff and supervisors need to know more about? Um, and in California, they brought in what's called cultural brokers, people who know that community, and they would team up the cultural brokers with the units, the practice units, 
so that the staff members have would have somebody they could turn to and say, I'm running into this issue with an aunt <clears throat> or this uh, elder in the neighborhood. What do I do about that? Or grandma has got some real concerns about the child moving to a, a nephew. What do we do with that? And how do I work through that? So cultural brokers is one thing, but the point here is what do we know more and more about that we don't know enough about? And then another you know, is what are some of the strategies that need to be added or strengthened? So I, I, uh, if people want to put ideas in the chat, we can help summarize those and get those back to you, but those are some of the things that are on our mind. Um, the next slide here is, uh, you know, uh, Amy and, and, and Judith and I were talking earlier, you know, we get the outcomes that we pay for. We get the outcomes in child welfare that our policies set us up for. So if we want to change some of those outcomes, I think we have to sometimes move upstream or move at a higher level and say, what policies need to change? What budgets issues need to change? Do we need to be allocating more money in a certain area? So when people ask me about uh, First Nations people, uh, what can we do differently to maybe increase our, our effectiveness for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Part of what we don't do a good job of in the United States, and I hear sometimes in Australia, is you've got to invest in the infrastructure. If tribal nations, if Aboriginal organizations don't have buildings, equipment, technology, and accounting services, how are they going to succeed? You know, and then they're accused of mismanagement of funds when we never gave them the accounting staff and the software they needed to manage those grants. It's a setup for failure. So we're coming to grips with that and having some hard conversations in the United States about we're a dollar late and um, two steps short of what we need to be doing in terms of enduring long-term investments in those communities to help them manage and care for their children and if we don't invest in infrastructure and if we don't invest in the staff the aboriginal staff or the torres strait and uh, torres strait islander staff or my navajo nation staff or our cowlitz indian stra staff if we don't invest in them and their communities they won't be able to step up and do what they need to do. So I, I call out infrastructure and I call out uh, the need to invest for multiple years in uh, building up staff and communities. Um, so I wanted to call that out as it's not a magic solution, but it's a really difficult long term investment that that needs to get made um, if we're really going to make the kind of progress that I think we want to make in our countries in these areas. Um, <clears throat> there's this is a from a some of the permanency values training. This is one of the slides I believe that's in that training and it's pretty detailed and you can look at it later, but it's just an, it's sort of an ecological approach with children and youth at the middle at the heart of it. But what do we want to do around getting all of our permanency oars in that rowboat rowing in the right direction? So I just uh, recommend that you take a look at that later and maybe you could modify it for Australia. All right, I'm going to end with a couple more practical strategies that you might find useful. The state of Georgia got sued because they had over 500 children languishing in care and the lawyers and the advocates said this is unacceptable. And so we teamed up with Georgia, the public child welfare agencies and some of the private agencies, and we developed a technique called the permanency roundtable. And I there may be aspects of this that you might find very practical um, and pieces of it you're already doing in Australia. So I, I wanted to mention to you, permanency roundtables, um, they consist basically of planning meetings to help revisit what's going on in the case so that maybe a child can have a better start, a fresh run at restoration or some other form of permanency. It might be guardianship or adoption. And the questions come from our veteran um, uh, parent who was, like I said, a foster parent and adoptive parent, Suba Doe, and she's, a, she's an icon in our field. And those are her questions. What is it gonna take to achieve permanency? What can we try that has been tried before, but now it's the right time to try it again? 
what can we try that has never been tried before with this child, but child, but we ought to do it. You know, let's reach out to the uncle in New Orleans that my friend, the judge in Seattle said, who cares if he's got diabetes and he's 67 years old? If he can take care for this child, he's family, we ought to be pulling him in. That's what Judge Clark would say. What can we try that has never been tried before? What things can we do at the same time? Because sometimes you've got to have multiple things going on. Therapy for anxiety and depression so the child's better able to move to a new permanency. Exploration of family finding doing things concurrently. And then how do we engage the youth so they feel like they're in charge partially of their life, that they have a choice in shaping their destiny? How can we engage the youth in planning for permanence? We don't do it for them, we do it with them. Those are the five key questions that are at the heart of a permanency roundtable discussion. And the goal there is not to criticize the worker, the goal there is not to second guess the worker. The goal there is to support that case worker in doing the best they can with a team of people to get that child to permanency. And that's what it is. It's as simple as that, but as you know, that would be hard to do skillfully, but that's what it is. Who's on the team? That's our next slide. It's a small team. You get a master practitioner, somebody who really knows how to do family restoration or permanency. You get an expert that's also uh, a permanency expert who understands the legal forms of permanency that are available to you in your community. Because we understand open adoption is not, um, you know, may not be a easy to use in, in some aspects, of, in some areas of Australia. Um, you, the case manager, of course, that's at the heart of it. Their supervisor, because they've got to back up the, uh, the person and then a facilitator. Now, I do want to mention there's a there's a dynamic that occurs in this that's called barrier busting. Um, and that is part of this team is trying to help the caseworker identify and then remove policy, mm -hmm. procedure, funding or other resource barriers that are getting in the way. So, for example, does the birth parent need their car fixed? so they can get to visitation. Do the grandparents need some type of a house modification? Like you throw up an extra wall to create a bedroom. A few hundred dollars worth of an effort. Again, go back to June Loy. We ought to be willing as much to invest as much in a family to keep them together as we would paying for placement services for year after year, right? So a wall or a house repair is pretty cheap investment if it means a permanency for the child. So barrier busting. Um, uh, Steve and I, were, we were talking earlier, um, you know, for some parents or relatives, you've got to have a policy exception because they had a drunk driving or some other type of criminal conviction 20 years ago that's preventing themselves from getting licensed or approved. Well, can we make an exception in those areas or um, the more fancy, more, uh, major effort. It's called felony expungements. In the United States, they're called you expunge a felony, you get it removed from your record. Um, you know, it may be time in Australia to explore some of those options if those are getting in the way of having excellent relatives who can step up and care for that child. So, anyways, exactly. <clears throat> Lastly, all right, you want to see the data. In a year, these five of oh, nearly 500 really difficult child situations, nearly a third of these children achieve permanency within a year after the roundtable process was put in place. And you can see there it's not all were restored. 8% got restored, 13% went into some type of legal guardianship, and 9% were adopted, mostly open adoptions, by the way. Um, so um, it really made a difference in a very under-resourced state. Georgia is not known for its being very liberal on stuff. So uh, we were very happy with it. OK, I'm going to close with um, <clears throat> our last section, which is a short section, which is barriers for permanency. So and what do we need for more research? So let's go to this. Uh, I, I just this is something that maybe a follow up webinar you might want to do, but we think there's some really major barriers to permanency that probably need to be explored in Australia and many other countries. And so what you might want to be doing 
as a, a community of practice is to think through what policies need to be changed. <clears throat> maybe it's around open adoption. Maybe it's around making customary adoption more available. It's something I'm going to explore with my American Indian colleagues when I get home and I have some trial. I have a tribal judge that is uh, my colleague at KC. And so I'm going to talk with Judge Finde and, and and figure out what I what can do to do that. So what you know, what's getting in the way around your policies? Felony expungements, resources for birth families so that they can keep they can be restored. What attitudes need to change? Sometimes it's a judge that needs to be coached by another judge around um, the value of a range of permanencies that not all children have to go home, that sometimes relatives can be a fantastic way to care for a child. So whose attitudes need to change in what way? Um, at times, uh, I'm gonna mention a process that you can explore. It's called business process mapping, BPM. It comes out of business and industry. Some of your top corporations use it. Business process mapping is where you is where you map through the steps in the casework process to figure out where you've got glitches, where do you have delays, where are there hangups. Illinois looked at this; they had nearly 500 children where the paperwork was holding up the adoptions, and once they got some concerted effort on the paperwork and some court delays, they got nearly 500 adoptions finalized in that large state in a year. So that's an example of business process mapping. Where do you have glitches in your foster parent recruitment, your adoptive parent recruitment? Where are there the glitches? And, and it's tried and true out of business and industry. Um, other barriers are we're struggling with getting enough foster families to foster teens. They'll all foster the babies, but they don't like the teens. And I think um, that's an area I think we're all struggling with in a lot of countries. So I just want to. I don't want to dismiss that. I think it's a very important worry. Various permanency options maybe we want to consider. And then I mentioned about the legal proceedings. So um, those are just some things maybe on a follow up webinar you could explore uh, with some chat rooms. Um, I'll end with um, some areas for future research. We just finished a major 15, 15 month effort or more where we were trying to figure out what were some key research gaps um, in child welfare in the United States. And some of these seem to be very relevant uh, um, in Australia. So we wanted to just mention them about, you know, what are the best combination of permanency strategies that make sense for different communities in Australia? You know, what's going to work in the outback? What's going to work in Perth? What's going to work in Adelaide? What's going to work with the Torres Strait Islanders? You know, what what combinations, what packages do you want to develop and champion and celebrate the successes of. I think is something that I think we we all would like to have. And this is where your university research partners can be really helpful for you. Um, we have 18 percent of our children in America go back into foster care. It's a revolving door for nearly one in five youth. What the hell is up with that? And what can we do to prevent it? So I think that's an issue. How do we prevent reentry into foster care? What can we do to make sure that then when that child goes home or goes to that aunt or uncle, they stick there and they don't have to go back into care. So I think that's an area that we could do a lot more work around. Um, what happens when ch children receive some kind of illegal permanency? You know, how, how does that work out? I know there have been a number of studies that do show that adoption outcomes for children are generally very positive. So if, if adoption is the right vehicle and option for that child, long-term research in multiple countries is documenting that it is a very positive permanency option for the right children. So I do want to reassure people that if it's done well, adoption can be a very good option uh, if family restoration can. Um, how do youth outcomes differ depending on the type of permanency? And then I understand you've extended foster care beyond age 18, which no, we, we no, not yet. Oh. We just passed that a couple of years ago. My uh, alumni studies by uh, Mark Courtney, um, Trudy Festinger, my studies with uh, Harvard Medical School. We all documented how children should not be booted out of foster care at age 18 as if they're magically able to care for themselves besides all that trauma. Hell, how many children in our own families are ready to leave care? You know, usually they get off to uni and they're still living at home while they're going to school or the whole point here is we actually have some new research that does show that extending foster care beyond age 18 
does help you succeed better. So uh, Mark Courtney's research in California and Illinois shows that. So I just want to mention that you might want to study that. I'm going to turn this over to Amy for an uh, opportunity on research. <laughs> Thank you. And then Steve, yes. I think, is going to make um, close this out with if we want to take a few other questions, we can. We've got, we're uh, six, seven minutes. Uh, Thank on you. Track. Yes, we have a few questions. We'll have to take yep. those. Um, <clears throat> as a response yeah, that um, Peter generously offered to do. Um, we also have a detailed handout that supports the presentation, which we'll send, and also the PowerPoint slides, which we'll send today. So you'll have those right after this presentation. Just so you know, I've posted a link in the chat. The Research Center for Children and Families is doing a study about restoration. Um, we're, we're learning about some of the underlying views and attitudes, and, and that's very important in line with what uh, Professor Picorda has just spoken about. It doesn't take long. It's a rainy day. What, what else are you going to do, honestly? So please take five minutes, and if you boost our, you know, our sample, we'll be so happy. So we, you know, you're exactly the people that we hope to reach with the survey. So please do to take a take a few minutes, do the survey, and it uses a particular methodology called Q methodology, which is about looking at viewpoints, and the way we analyze that is to see if there are clusters of viewpoints. It's kind of an interesting and different way of doing a survey, but it shouldn't take too long. So thank you so much. The link is in the chat, um, and I'm, we're now going to hand over to Steve to ask some questions. Yeah, or right, make some comments, some concluding comments. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, I've got a lot of questions, Amy, but we haven't got all. <laughs> and so, look, that was that was absolutely uh, fantastic, and I, I uh, what a wonderful presentation on um, the various elements of, of getting permanency practice right. Um, I just want to make, a, I suppose, some, some side observations that uh, what is really clear from not only Peter's presentation today, but having read of the work of, of Peter and the foundation is that how it's informed by evidence, which is constantly being built upon brick by brick because we have to get it right for those we're serving. Research and data but not research as an end in itself, instead operating within a strong practice to research fra framework and not research that sits on the shelf. And so there's related active consideration and debate, and it's interesting to, to have read some of that of recent times over what should be on the research agenda. I think uh, 300 gaps were, uh, were identified, weren't they, uh, Peter, in terms of areas. And so it was about let's get serious about what we need to be focusing on it's going to make the most different. What constitutes the critical data that needs to be obtained, assessed in terms of what it's telling us, and then uh, uh, requires an action operationally. And so uh, that's of critical importance in New South Wales. Uh, absolutely important that we uh, have a you know a permanency program as well. Uh, the the permanency support program, close to a, a billion dollar a year program. How are, are we engaging together, both government and non-government, in terms of assessing, uh, well, collecting, first of all, the data, assessing it and responding uh, to what it tells us? What it's telling uh, the US uh, is that there are some strong indicators in terms of reduction of kids um, unnecessarily coming into care, strong indicators in terms of permanency outcomes. Um, what I do also note is that it's well what it, it, it's also telling the US is in terms of its First Nation people that there's much more to be done and not to, but working with the leadership and under the leadership of First Nation people and alongside the leadership of First Nation people in terms of the, the, the results. And of course, that uh, resonates very much uh, in this country. So we need research, but we need research to, to practice. We need to be thinking about what, uh, and we need to operationalize the information that's obtained. And there needs to be, it's interesting that the partnership in the US involves government and non-government coming together and analyzing this information. And then yes, I gather Peter from our discussions, much debate which is important, but it actually, uh, there's a growing consensus around what's required. And that consensus also, of course, and it's very timely with the recommissioning, in, uh, is around the fact that there has to be a very strong commitment 
to wherever possible, prever preserving family uh, with the right supports to an early intervention approach. Um, and, you know, safety, I note the comments that have been mentioned in, uh, in terms of safety and, uh, and that uh, Peter's observations about there needs to be sophistication in this area and a multi-dimensional, rigorous, robust assessment approach. We're also looking for alternatives within family and within culture uh, to removal um, wherever possible. Now, look, that does, uh, Peter, uh, your presentation and injustice. Um, can I thank you very much for, for, for you know, your, your presentation today? And let me say again, um, the passion is there, Peter, but also what's wonderful is the research, right, that sits behind it and the fact that increasingly you've got government and non-government working together to have a, a look at what it's telling you in the US with a commitment to together responding so that we drive better outcomes. I think uh, what a wonderful yarn between the US and, and uh, New South Wales and Australia more broadly should be taking place about how well we're doing that because those we serve deserve nothing less. So thank you for today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone Everybody. for joining us today. Yeah, final words? Uh, I'm an optimist. You know, we know more now about practice than we ever have. And I think in how do we build on that? I think uh, it, it, there's all these opportunities for us out there. And I think, Steve, you articulated those and, and crystallized them in such a great way. So it's on that. It's a note of optimism that I think we should end this presentation that we are really set up as a field, despite the gaps, we are really set up for success in a way that we haven't had been before, if the right policies practices and supports can be put in place so it's good and thank you for every everybody for taking your time on a again another bit rainy australian day to spend time with us take care thank you everyone